Well, a very warm welcome to you, wherever you are in the world. My name is John Harris. I work for the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, and I head up the education and business development aspects of our international operation. This is the second of our In Conversation recordings, and we're carrying on with the really important theme of green technology and sustainability. So with me today, I've got uh, Misko Ivasco, who is a chartered member in New Zealand. He's the Portfolio Delivery Director, looking after strategic programs and major infrastructure projects at Auckland Transport. Um, a very warm welcome, Misko. Kia ora, John. How are you going? Hey, great to see you again and connect after all these years. Um, we remember Misko from some of the very first conferences I attended back in 2012 with the Institute. And it's great to see how his careers developed and unfolded over that time. So we're going to uh, pick up straight away. Misko, just tell us a little bit about your, yourself and what you do. Yeah, so um, so transport planner by background. I've been in New Zealand now for the best part of 14 years, years going through a number of different roles, but predominantly leading and driving and developing teams to do some great things for, for Auckland and New Zealand. So uh, leading a lot of the delivery arms of the, the projects all the way from planning through to, to construction. And at the moment, working for Auckland Transport as the delivery director for strategic programs. Excellent. Um, now, certainly, um, we're, we're really excited to hear about the Auckland dimension. I think this is our first kind of in conversation where we've been talking about uh, an example there. So we're really excited. Um, what would be good is for you to just tell us a little bit about your delivery director role. And then I think you've actually got a, a film to show us. Yeah, I haven't. Well, while we're talking about Auckland as well, just a quick plug, because we, we are the, the most livable city at the moment, as, as of uh, last week. So um, that was really, really good and something that we're all proud of. Um, the delivery director role is, is one that was set up at Auckland Transport to really develop the, the teams of people that drive some of our more complex, large strategic programs. So I'll, I'll show you one in a, in a little while that we've got in the heart of downtown Auckland that really showcases what we do. But it's, uh, it's really focused on some of the, the more complex programs and projects. And Auckland as a city is uh, it's growing. It's still quite small relative to other cities. So we've got 1.4 million people and growing, but at the same time, there's a lot of great stuff going on. So great to be part of the, the Auckland Transport family delivering some really cool stuff. Brilliant. And this, of course, is excellent timing, isn't it? With you being voted this uh, most livable city, uh, we couldn't have had a better week to pick to do um, our in conversation. So let's just pause and let's have a look at what's happening in downtown Auckland. The transformation of downtown Auckland is about to make it easier and safer for people to move around when they're working, living, visiting or travelling in the city centre. We want the city to be friendly, safe and vibrant, a destination rather than a thoroughfare. We're undertaking one of the biggest projects Auckland has ever seen, and the transformed downtown will be a dynamic place of arrival, departure and connection. We're making Key Street into a people-friendly place, with wider footpaths and safe cycleways, and that's not all we're transforming. We're creating a new public space extending out over the water where people can relax and enjoy the harbour. Six new ferry berths will be on Queen's Wharf to allow the ferry terminal to operate more efficiently. And all this is tied in with other projects like Lower Albert Street with its new bus interchange, the new commercial bay development where we're working with other partners to create a better street environment, and at Lower Queen Street where we're joining up with a new public space delivered by the City Rail Link. All these areas around Key Street, the new ferry terminal, the streets and laneways are integrated together by one cohesive design. We're making it easy to move between the major transport hubs with more space for people to get to their workplaces and all the fun stuff you'll be coming to downtown to enjoy. We're doing this now because over the next 10 years there'll be eight times as many people using the waterfront area every single day. Key Street was originally designed for cars with most of the space taken up by traffic lanes. We're planning to change this. We'll keep two of the general traffic lanes and reallocate the space from the other two lanes to the thousands more people who'll be moving through and accessing the area. And we know the numbers are coming. 
The completion of Commercial Bay will see 10,000 workers in that precinct alone. And when the City Rail Link opens in 2024, the projections show pedestrian traffic at Britomart will double. That's why we have to get moving and do this now. It's a massive project for Auckland, and yes, it's going to be disruptive for a while. But when it's finished, downtown Auckland is going to be a world-class waterfront destination that all of us can enjoy. Well, thanks for that. That was a really fantastic video, a really good insight uh, to a flavour of some of the creative, innovative and uh, placemaking techniques that you're deploying um, in Auckland itself. So let's just kick off with your first question. Now, you've worked internationally, you've worked in the UK, you've worked in New Zealand and you've covered, I guess, a myriad of projects in your career. Um, mm. Difficult question. <laughs> what does a sustainable city mean to you, Misko? Well, where, where do you start with that, John? Sometimes we, we dive straight into the, the, the more green ecological side of that, but it, it means a number of different things. So when you look at a sustainable city, you talk about the, the economics of a city. So it being economically sustainable and being able to generate good wealth for people living in, in and around the city. There's a big social impact as well and something that we're very strong on in Auckland and New Zealand is the social partnerships and procurement that comes with sustainability and obviously at the moment across the the world as well as New Zealand there's a big focus on climate change sociability so what we're doing with our infrastructure how we can achieve mode shifts from different people using different modes across the the transport network and really focus on climate change for ourselves and future generations so when you look at a sustainable city there's lots of different parts to what that entails, and they've all got quite different challenges in relation to each other. Yeah, that's a really good overview. Before we go into some of the key projects and some of the examples, I just want to pick up on the, that sustainability, because obviously we all know that there's kind of economic, there's environmental and social. And I just want to pick up on economic and social. You mentioned the word procurement, and of course a lot of our members in CRT around the world are involved in this. Um, just explain to me a little bit about how your procurement policies may be more sustainable friendly. For example, are you looking at employing cooperatives, um, companies with gender balance or those that are from the small medium enterprise sector? Have you got kind of a different approach to engaging those grassroots community and more local organisations in the, the food chain, if you like, for some of these big projects? Absolutely. It's something that's very important to us as a society in New Zealand. We have this um, saying that's hetangata, 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 and that means it's all about people, people, people. And when you look at the social procurement side, it is looking at giving people opportunity across New Zealand. And if you've got big projects and Auckland Transport have got many projects, small, medium, large, that we can tie in local communities, businesses, individuals, that's something that we look to do through procurement. So um, a good example of that is the, the Eastern Busway that we're constructing at the moment. So a simple story as part of that, we, we need to provide a number of plants for the, the urban design components of the, the busway. So rather than do that through your, your major contractors, as you would traditionally do, we've actually gone to the local market. We've uh, partnered up with local Pacifica businesses and got them set up as a business. So we basically supply, they supply the plants, we, we pay for the plants for the project. And as a result, you get a sustainable business that comes off the back of it, that can provide more plants for new and great things across Auckland. So there's, um, there's lots of those from the what you do on the projects through to actually the catering that we get at Auckland Transport that's all procured through social procurement. Fantastic. So um, let's expand on those examples a little bit. You, you've mentioned that social one and the greening working together. Looking at the portfolio, um, what makes them special in terms of sustainability? I know you've got some quite exciting stuff uh, going on around the oceans and around sort of, you know, cleaning of the impacts on the harbour. Tell us a bit more about some of those. Yeah, so um, great example on, on downtown. So the downtown programme we've just seen the, the video is due to open up over the next few weeks. So it's an exciting time for Auckland and really brings the, the waterfront to, to the people and what's a quite a culturally sensitive, sensitive place for Auckland, which is also known as Tamaki Makarau 
over here. So in, in looking at the, the relationship between the water and the land, making sure that we have the water clean and getting rid of pollutants is very important to, to all of us, especially Manor Fenua in Auckland, who are key partners on the, on the program. So what, what we did was run a trial through mussels. So I, I didn't know this until I came to New Zealand, but we've um, so got a lot of mussels in New Zealand and they're actually really good at cleaning water. So we've got a number of mussel ropes that hang underneath the harbour as part of the programme. We've been doing some trials where we've been putting the, the mussels that we've taken up from the Coromandel about two hours from Auckland and they basically filter the water. So one mussel john can filter 150 to 200 litres of water a day. Can you believe that? It's, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty yeah. cool stuff. So um, yeah, so we're using mussels to basically replenish and clean the harbour. So those are the types of trials that we can get into if we start to think a little bit differently and partner up across the different relationships. Yeah. Fantastic. A, a, a real innovation there. And uh, yeah, that's an amazing fact about the, the muscles and kind of the, the processes that they can undertake naturally. Um, yeah. well, let's move actually into that wider sustainable construction debate. Now, I think there's been a big shift over the last 20 years about more sustainable transport um, schemes being constructed, sustainability and, and actually built environment projects as well. Obviously, there are global standards around energy efficiency and the way buildings work, but we've also seen transport infrastructure really trying to take some leaps and bounds. Um, just thinking about the practices you've adopted here in Auckland, um, you mentioned the muscles, but anything else that's got a good environmental impact, um, perhaps go to a, a couple of different case studies. Yeah, a couple of different ones. Um... So yeah, a mod, mod shift across Auckland is, is really big for us, not just for Auckland Transport, but for uh, the whole of the Auckland Council family and population. If you, if you look at New Zealand, it's um, 5 million people across quite a big area. So there are very, very long distances between different parts. And even in Auckland itself, it's quite vast in terms of its size. So probably uh, about the size of Greater London from end to end, but with one point four to 1.6 million people. So that, that, that's led to um, lack of choice over the years and it being quite a car dominated city, just more by space and function and the way that things have been set up. So a, a big role that we play is, is mode shift. And as, as part of that, we've, we've been looking at not only the, the switches between modes, between cars, PT, walking and cycling, but also the types of vehicles that we're using. So we've uh, we introduced our first hydrogen vehicles into the fleet. For, for Auckland Transport and we're we're moving to probably predominantly an electric fleet of buses. So I mean that, that's um new greener technology, but obviously something that you need to bring in and think about carefully. Trial, we're also looking at future electric ferries as well as part of the the broader choice that people get to use in Auckland. But it's it's not just about moving to electric, it's looking at how we can shift and influence behavior. Because the, the big thing at the moment over here, especially in the, the larger cities, is around providing not just choice, but reliable choice. And we're doing a lot of retrofitting what would have been legacy from years ago and trying to create a city where people love to be and have choice to move around in whichever way they choose to. Excellent. Can I just pick up on that, on the mode shift, because it goes straight into my next question about um, congestion and travel demand management. Now, there's a lot of interest in this globally because of the pandemic. Um, we've seen a kind, a kind of a big surge in travel demand management uh, professionalisation. I mean, here in the UK, there's now a, a travel demand management forum, which has been constructed by uh, CILT. Uh, here to actually look at that cross-cutting theme. It covers both freight and people movement. So um, a really important opportunity. Um, I just want to pick up on the culture change. Um, describe what you've had to do to push people to move to public transport. Are you having to get them to do tiny steps at a time? So perhaps take the bus one day a week, perhaps go for a cycle ride. Or are you uh, seeing that there's much more dramatic changes, particularly with COVID, people are now sticking with their bikes, you know, all the time. Um, what have you needed to do to really push people to that sustainable travel thinking? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a combination of things. So I mean, you've got the, the infrastructure part as, as enabling. So we've had some quite big projects and future projects that are going to be 
in play. So that's things like your, your new busways. We've got a big Eastern busway that's going to be in place over the, the next three to four years and a city rail link going in. So there's the infrastructure part, but a lot of it is it's the, um, it's the small push. It's the, the behavior. It's the providing access to transport. So we'll, we'll do a lot of work with communities and businesses on initiatives such as providing free public transport for a period of time. So you get a hop card, which is similar to your, your Oyster cards that you, you get elsewhere. So you can move around the network and it gives people the opportunity to experience what it would be like to go on the, the bus or go on the train. So yeah, working with businesses as well, as businesses move around, we, we go in and actively get involved in providing information around choice because sometimes people just don't know what the choices are. So to get in there and to make people more aware on what, what's available is very important. Um, COVID's had a, a huge impact as it, as it has across the, the world. So um, just before COVID with, within Auckland, we hit a hundred million trips for one year, which for an Auckland perspective was a target that we were going for for quite a while. Since COVID, obviously that, that dropped quite substantially, but we're now back up to around 60 to 70% and growing of where we were before COVID which is, is, is great. And um, part, part of that has been the, the push through our communications, the, the active messaging around getting people in and moving around the network back to the city, but ultimately the way that people have moved and changed since COVID will have an impact. I mean, the, the city center is just an example of that. We've got, um, You've got a vibrant city center that's growing, but then you've got office space that is declining as people are choosing to work from home certain days of the week and be more flexible in what they do. So I think joint term, it's a challenge that we've all got across the, the world. And that's notwithstanding the fact that being on public transport, for example, means that you need to be next to different people. And COVID has made a number more nervous about doing that. So we, we've got to make sure that we, we continue doing what we're doing. We provide choice for infrastructure, education, through communication, and really encourage people to look at the options and choices. And one thing that we're doing as part of the downtown program and through Auckland Council, we've had a bunch of things that we've done over the last year that we're really proud of as, as Auckland. So we're, we're looking at trying to get people into the city that may be a free public transport day, but these initiatives like that, which really encourage people to get to see what the choices are and what, what it is that we have done. But I think it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough everywhere, but you've got to keep pushing, don't you? Yeah, no, and picking up on that, the keep pushing, the keep persuading, you're, you're, you're quite a, an energetic innovator. I, I, I'd say yeah. Misko, you've tried new things and some things work, some things don't, but yeah, you just have to keep pushing at it and trying to keep that mode share um, creeping up in favor of the sustainable choices. I mean, if you had to sum up your vision for Auckland and you could do anything you wanted, yeah, and you had yeah. a free hand, what else would you do? What hasn't think, happened yet? No, number one, and I think, John, this applies to many cities. The, um, the things that hold us back are the, the people and the relationships. And as cities get bigger, there's more people doing different things. So whether it's big client organisations like Auckland Transport and Council and developers, We've, we're all doing things, if we can start to bring those relationships closer together, you tend to get more innovation, more things tend to happen and more things done. So it's, um, it's not for me, build the next projects and people will come. It's invest in the relationship, invest in the relationships and the partnerships, and then you actually will get a lot of benefit through sustainability, economics, social gain. So for me, it's, um, it, it, it is invest time and effort more around the partnerships and the people than sometimes we we go projects first and people and partnerships second let's flip that round yeah no absolutely um i mean back here in the uk when i was looking at some strategic changes to local transport plans i think there's been a a big shift instead of saying let's put you know bunk together a whole pile of projects that seem to make sense into families of investment you're looking very much what, at what is people-centric so a tool that might work in one place in one town 
a town even 12 miles, 50 miles down the road, culturally, socially, economically, it may not hit. So, for example, cycle hire may take off in a, a town where it's not just about topography and rainfall. It's actually about social attitudes to cycling. And in the other town, it's like, well, we, we like to get the bus, you know, and they both can sit side by side. But that cultural and social respect is really important. I'll throw in an extra question here, if you don't mind, which is with this people centric approach. Do you think the way that funding is allocated and decided might need to change? Because you could come up with rules for capital investment, which is kind of going the old way, or you could say it needs to be a much softer people-focused um, outcome-based way of evaluation. And sometimes some of the, the physical schemes, it's difficult to do the maths um, in the old way and apply it, yep. it truly to what people need. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's um, 2021, counting cars to say what you're going to do is not yeah. going to get you the, the results so we, we we do need to look differently it's um it's hard because some of these things aren't tangible and there's no hard metrics you can drive towards them so we're gonna have to think around how we do that and for me sometimes the line's not straight so if we look 20 30 40 years ahead and we say our plan's going to look like this that the line's going to be wiggly as you get there and you might end up slightly different from where where you sit out so we've got to be adaptable around that change and yeah, I think the traditional way of assessing to drive an outcome, we 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 need to to shift. But I think learn from each other as well. It's not yeah. just Auckland doing it in New Zealand. We're doing the same things across the world, same challenges, and we can bring stuff together and learn. I think with CILT, that's something that really struck me as well. Because we um we met in Sri Lanka, didn't we? And the the amount of people from different backgrounds and cultures that were there that had experiences that you could draw off and learn from. I mean, that that's that's what's going to move us forward as a a global society, not not just yeah. Auckland and New Zealand. Yeah, and what we have to remember is our, our, our countries are our diverse places now. You know, um, in my local town, I think there's a square mile where there's people from about, you know, 35 40 different cultures and, and races and different languages and i think london's in in excess of 250 different you know languages spoken and you know auckland melbourne other places will give similar metrics i guess i guess the challenge um here and i totally get it is that that social dimension and how that links to sustainability is quite difficult to measure but I think as transport planners, we mustn't be frightened of that. We must really embrace it. Um, I'm grappling with issues around social value at the moment and how we quantify that within a community project, um, because there's so many ways it's having impact, but there isn't a formula or a spreadsheet that actually declares it. Yeah. And uh, there's so much good, but it almost feels like it's bubbling under the surface and it can't be counted. Um, and I think there's a real challenge for us wherever we are in the world to tackle that. Um, that brings us um, to a question actually about CILT. Um, what do you think we should be doing? Um, think of it as country level like CLT New Zealand or even internationally. What should we be doing in terms of this place making and people making message and really making a difference to the cities that we live and move around? Yeah, I think there's these two things for, for me in that. I think the, the first one, if you, if you look at any type of change, change requires champions and people to drive it. So if we believe in placemaking and creating cities for people and future generations, we, we've got a bunch of champions in CIRLT that can drive that through connecting, influencing, and making sure that message is heard. So that, that, that's really important. The, um, the second part is the, is the connection. So we, we can tend to get quite busy in our own places, but the, the beauty of organizations like CILT, it's, it's got a global reach. So we, we need to put extra effort into how we, how we connect with each other, how we can learn from each other's case studies and learnings, because you can pick stuff up, apply it. It might not be directly, but there might be bits of that that you might spark an idea that you can then do somewhere else. So I think the, the championing, and the, the connection are two, two really key things. Excellent. And 
actually, even we've been virtual for the last 15 months, accelerating mm -hmm. that communication, speeding up the transferability of the best practice is really why, why we've been here, um, serving and supporting the various CILT countries. So um, this is think, cool, isn't it? Same thing. Yeah, yeah brilliant. I think yeah. one final, final question on the big picture. So you get the last say here, Misko. Um, <laughs> where does the emphasis need to go? on urban mobility going forward. So is it on infrastructure? Is it on green tech? Is it on operations? Is it on behavior change? Is it legislation? Or is it kind of a mix of all of them? What What's your view on that big question? Yeah, you probably got a sense from just the, the, the way I've been given examples and my passion, first of all, obviously around, around people, which involves behavior change, but you, you need to put effort into each of these things. But I think the, the effort needs to go in how we bring some things together because we can't look at technology in isolation from infrastructure in isolation from green infrastructure sometimes they might be slightly different but we need to try and put a giant lens on this which i mean as, as transport planners that's what we we should be doing isn't it so i think it's um people first but you've got all those components that are really important for us to to move forward fantastic well, Misko, that was 25 minutes, and I found cool. that extremely inspirational, innovative, and very encouraging um, about what you're doing uh, down under in Auckland. Um, it was a real insight into sustainable city planning. And uh, wherever you are in the world, hopefully you've just taken some gems, some kernels, some ideas. Um, don't forget that you can find out more about Auckland. I'm sure Misko will be delighted if you dip into the Auckland Transport uh, website or wider uh, websites available covering urban planning uh, in, the, in the city. Um, delve, look a little bit more into this. And uh, we've been delighted that you've given up some time, Misko, just to share your professional views. So, with no more ado, thanks so much for joining us for our In Conversation with Mishko Ivasco, Portfolio Delivery Director at Auckland Transport. Mishko, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm.